You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. Island View with hosts Teresa O'Leary and Marshall Freeze. Welcome to Island View, a weekly current affairs show about Gabriola Island. I'm Teresa O'Leary. And I'm Marshall Fries. Thanks for joining us. Today on the program, we have coverage from the Gabriola Museum's Storytime event, which was held last weekend. But first, Teresa interviews Stephen Earle from Sustainable Gabriola, who brought you the Gertie Bus and much more. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Yeah, thanks. So tell us all about Sustainable Gabriola. It's been an organization on the island for uh, just over a decade. Yeah. Um, you know, what's it all about and who's involved? So I can't tell you all about it. I don't know every facet of it, but as you said, it's been around for a dozen or so years. It's one of the most sort of ad hoc organizations on the island. It, we're not an official society. We don't have a bank account. We don't have an, an executive structure or anything like that. All of our meetings are uh, sort of, um, they're not, you know, we don't use Robert's rules. We just do things by consensus and there's no chair. It, well, each meeting has a facilitator, but that rotates. So it, it's a very loose organization. Um, there's, when we meet, we meet once a month, and there's usually maybe 12 or 14 people at the meetings, but it varies quite a lot. Um, and uh, we just talk about issues that are important to the sustainability, the environmental sustainability of Gabriola. Um, so all sorts of things, climate change, of course, uh, but uh, lots of other different aspects, food, housing, uh, health, transportation, all sorts of things. Did the organization decide to do it that way, to kind of have it be more of a collaborative type totally. of uh, Yeah, group? it was a very conscious decision to be a collaborative kind of group and not a, a highly organized group. Why was that so important to the group at that time? Or back That's then? a good question and I cannot answer it because I wasn't there right at the very start. Okay, so, that's, that's no problem. Yeah. So tell me about some of the initiatives that Sustainable Gabriola has been involved in over yeah. the last period of time. So a lot, lots of initiatives that are really important to this island. Um, for example, uh, Gurney Bus. Yeah, that was an initiative of Sustainable Gabriola. It, it took on a life of its own, as you can imagine. Uh, Why was that identified as an important issue in terms of sustainability? Um, because we know that we need to reduce the amount that people drive. It's critical to our efforts to reduce our climate impact. So that's how it started. Gertie, Gertie Bus was initially all about reducing GHG emissions, but it has become much more of a social thing. A social benefit to the community. A lot of people that don't have transportation didn't, now do, and and um, that is really important. We think. Yes, I mean public transit in cities like Vancouver. I mean they've been spending, you know, for the last many decades they've been spending a lot of money educating people about getting out of their car yeah. and getting into public transit. Yeah. And on the islands and on Gabriola is the same. It's more of a car culture here. Totally, uh, still. It totally is, yeah, and it's a hard thing to change, to get people out of their cars. Yeah, so, so. is that something that's on your, your focus, your agenda? It, it certainly is for Gertie. Yes. To, to uh, 
get people out of their cars and into public transit, it, and it's not easy. I can assure you, because I'm I'm on the board of the Gertie bus as well. Okay, so we can talk to you a little bit more about the Gertie bus, then, which yeah. I take every day. I'm a public transit user. Okay. I gave up my car in Vancouver seven nice. years ago yeah. so that I could help the climate and yeah. also take part in public transit, which I actually love. Okay. So tell me some more about Gertie in terms of what's coming down, uh, coming forward in the future. I know there's some initiatives on the way about electric yeah, vehicles. Yeah, totally. There is. A, you know, I, I, I can't even talk about it. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> We've applied for federal government funding to purchase two electric buses. Um, <laughs> the official announcement from the federal government has not yet been made, although it could be in the next week or two. So okay. uh, it's possible that this shouldn't be broadcast. <laughs> We're going to get you in trouble. You could get me in big trouble. Um, as soon as they make their announcement, then we can make an announcement. Okay. Yes, but well, the word is out there already on the I island. I understand that the word I've, is I've out there. I've heard that yeah. from so many people. Okay, so putting that aside, that concern, tell me about the electric buses and why you made yeah, that so uh, step. It's been a long-term goal of the Gertie bus to reduce emissions. That's part of our mandate. Uh, we started out using waste vegetable oil in the buses, uh, found that as engine technologies changed, you couldn't use waste vegetable oil anymore, it just didn't work. So then we started making our own biodiesel out of waste vegetable oil and we used that and, and eventually that wasn't working very well in buses anymore. So for the last three or four years we've been strictly diesel. Uh, and our goal has always been to go completely fossil fuel free. So we've always wanted to switch to electric. Um, and so now we are anticipating some grant money to do that. And our intention is within the next 12 months to have two brand new electric buses here. And, and uh, uh, we, it is a realizable goal. Right, and so. you know that there's been an impact from that initiative. You've experienced it, witnessed it, that there was an impact from that step, that action of creating the Gertie bus. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, it's tell been me, very, very positive in the community uh, for the most part. I mean, some people don't want their taxes going to public transit or anything public, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, generally it has been positive. There was a, a referendum on on using property tax to fund the Gertie bus and that was approved where in other places, as you know, those kind of things have not been approved. Right. So that's been a big help. Um, unfortunately, we're not like other transit in British Columbia that gets get money from the Ministry of Transportation. A significant part of funding for BC transit operations is from, from the government in addition to their tax base. We don't get any of that. We, Why not? <sighs> Why are the Good islands question. outside of that? Well, it's not islands per se. It's that we're not seen as an official transit provider in the eyes of the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So we have asked specifically, can we be funded in the same way as BC Transit? And they have said no. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, so tell me some other initiatives that are on the agenda. I know you talked about the 12-12-12. Tell us about that. So yeah, that's an initiative of Sustainable Gabriola and it is to change the story around climate change and, and get people involved because we know there's a great deal of climate anxiety out there and that when you get people involved in something like that, it reduces the anxiety level in it. So that's one part of it, is to get people more engaged, but also, obviously, it is to make some real changes here that, that reduce our climate impact. So 12-12-12, it's 12 months, because it took place over 12 months, uh, 12 wicked climate problems, uh, and 12 locally d d derived solutions to those problems. That's what the 12s are all about. I see, okay. And, it, and the last month was August, so last month. 
Um, and now we're moving that into what we're calling Climate 12 Action. Um, and we're, we've created, or are creating, a number of action groups based on some of the 12 climate topics that are important and we're moving ahead with that okay. to start making some changes. Can you tell me about one or two of the actions or changes yeah, I, that are... Yeah, I certainly can. Um, but I just wanted to say that the, they kind of fall into two categories. Um, one is actions that will reduce our climate impact, like driving less, having houses that are better insulated, more climate ready. So those are things that are going to change our impact. But the other things are ad adaptations to climate change because it's happening, everybody knows that. So that could mean things like uh, people's health, uh, their, how they're feeling about climate change, so the health and wellness part of it, or water supply because uh, water supply is a huge issue here and it's getting worse because of climate change, because of the way, well, heat for one thing, but also how the weather's changing a bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like you have in that plan, you're taking into account really the mental health of, of people yeah, as well. Yeah, that's critical. You're talking about anxiety, you're talking about health and well-being to make sure people are adapting. Yeah. Uh, Talk to me a little bit more about that. Have you noticed that going up this summer because of the wildfire season or risk that's been going on and continues to go on across Canada and in BC? Yeah, I'm not going to say I've noticed um, something about people's attitudes or how they're feeling because it's not something we're measuring. Of course. Um, but I certainly know that people are talking about it and they are worried about it. And, and you know, it, it hasn't been so bad this summer here because it hasn't been particularly smoky. Right. We've had a few few days, a week or so when it was visibly smoky here. But in other parts of British Columbia, oh, it, and that smoke, the pall of the fire smoke in the air and the fact you can't see the sky, and that has a significant impact on people. And we've seen that before here when, when there was a lot of smoke here and, and people were very anxious about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. That's one of the things that I've noticed that, you know, we can so easily slip into conversations that are ap apocalyptic yeah. right now. Um, yeah. And um, I was wondering what approach people are taking to that, and so it sounds like Sustainable Gabriola is including that as part of your plan. Definitely. It's, it, yeah, part of the plan. One of the, the big things that came out of the Climate 12, 12, 12 initiative was the importance of neighborhoods hmm. um, and of people working with their neighbors, helping their neighbors, getting to know their neighbors. So in as we move forward, that's going to be a big part of, of the initiative is to strengthen neighborhood cohesiveness uh, because it's really at the neighborhood level that we can um, reduce anxiety and make changes and get people to work work together. Why is that? Why when you take it down to that level do you think you can have more impact? <clears throat> Just experience, I mean when there's a crisis you turn to your immediate neighbors. Uh, I mean 15 years ago there was a massive snowfall and all this, there was a meter of snow on the ground and the streets were all blocked and, and people just went to make sure their neighbors were okay and they asked if they needed anything and they said, can I help shovel your driveway and that sort of thing. So it's, it's at the neighborhood level that we respond to those kind of crises. It's interesting because we just did a show this last week about uh, neighborhood emergency preparedness. Right. Um, the Wild Cherry neighborhood had a, a meeting and they had some authorities come in and speak to them, the fire yeah. smart coordinator yeah. and Shirley Nicholson, you know, the emergency yeah, yeah, yeah. preparedness uh, uh, person. And um, it was fascinating because what you have just said about the neighborhood thing, I feel like we saw in our coverage of that last week uh, because everybody that we interviewed, they were talking about 
that importance of getting to know the person next door or yeah. in your on your street yeah. and building relationships so that in an emergency you can help each other out. Yeah. Right. It's really important. And on Gabriel, there are some neighborhoods, Wild Cherry might, might be an example, that are, are now well organized and have been for some time, and others that are not at all. And so we think it's important to enhance that. So you'll be trying to identify the neighborhoods that yeah, need that and yeah. reaching out to them or is that you perhaps know? not sure. Not sure of the plan. Not yet. sure where we're going. Okay, but, but that's the that goal. That is the goal. Okay. Part of the goal. Right. Okay. Yeah. So what else uh, in terms of initiatives going forward? What can we look forward to in the next year or so? from Sustainable Gabriel. What will you Whoa. guys be working on? So the, uh, some of the other things we've worked on, um, we've helped to create some new co-ops on Gabriola that didn't exist before. One of them is an energy co-op, uh, another is a, an investment co-op. Uh, we helped to get the Aggie co-op back uh, working as a co-op. The Aggie co-op is one of the oldest co-ops in British Columbia. It's been here since the 1930s. Um, and it was all, had been for many decades a strong working co-op, but in the last uh, 20 years or so, it had kind of decayed a little bit in terms of its acting like a co-op. So uh, we helped to rejuvenate the Aggie co-op as a co-op and it's it's nice to see it coming back in that way. Tell me some more about the Aggie Co-op. I'm new here, so I actually am not familiar with it. Okay, so it's it's a group of people. A lot of them are farmers um, that work together to uh, promote farming, uh, but they're the ones that operate the farmers market on Saturday, the farmers, the, the evening farmers market on Wednesday. Um, the food hub, which is where the food is available and is transported around the island to subscribers and, and things like that. And they're also working now towards the establishment of a co-op store okay. um, so that there will be l l access to local produce year-round. Um, and that Part of what Aggie Co-op's doing in that regard is trying to enhance the production of food so that there will always be some food in the co-op store year-round. Right, so, right. Um, so getting some co-ops off the ground is really important. And, and I mentioned the energy co-op. Uh, so one thing, the energy co-op uh, is involved in the heat pump project. Um, Tell me about I that. I can tell you about that. So heat pumps are an, a very efficient way of heating buildings um, because unlike an electric baseboard, which just generates heat by resistance, a heat pump takes the heat that's in the air and concentrates it and, and uses that to heat a room. And it's three to four times more efficient energy-wise to do it that way than, than with a baseboard or with some other method. Uh, and as you're probably aware, heat pumps are growing quickly. So the energy co-op, um, working with an organization called Island Futures, uh, I'm not sure, six or eight years ago now, uh, became the dealer for a particular brand of heat pumps and started providing them to Gabriolans at near to cost level. And um, now there are well over a thousand heat pumps installed in houses on Gabriola when you consider that there are probably only 3,000 houses. Uh, we're probably the heat pump capital of Canada. <laughs> Seriously. Um, That's there's, impressive, really. Yeah. A uh, thousand heat pumps on an island of 3,000 people, yeah. Yeah. Or 3,000 homes, I swear. Yeah, yeah 4,000 yes. and some, yes. something people, but yeah, it is impressive. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one thing the Energy Co-op does. We're also working on uh, increasing the installation of solar energy on Gabriola. Um, <clears throat> we have been part of the 
use of waste vegetable oil first in the gurdy buses right, uh, right. but now we're working on a project to take waste vegetable oil from restaurants um, and there are several here and using that to heat greenhouses um, so that we can enhance the year-round productivity of food mm. so that's a project that we're just getting going on lately. Well, that's very interesting because I wanted to ask you about food security. We do yeah, live on an yeah, island and yeah. of course it's always an issue for islands to be sustainable around food. How are we doing on Gabriola around that? Well, not great, <laughs> but there's potential to be great. Uh, Vancouver Island used to be food, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, self-sufficient right and probably so did Gabriel we were probably exporting food from Gabriola many decades ago but of course that's changed globalization and everything and now we're not food self-sufficient at all most of our food is coming from away um, so the goal is to increase our self-sufficiency in food for all sorts of reasons a it's better food uh, B, it's less transportation involved in that food. C, it's less reliance on other places that are growing food that are maybe not going to be able to grow food in the same way they have because of climate change, because of lack of water, because too much heat, what have you. So being more self-sufficient in food is good for us. And we, that's one of the things that uh, Sustainable Gabriola is working we're on. We're working on that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. In, in, along with the Aggie Co-op and others, um, yeah, trying to right. enhance that. So, you know, we've been talking about sustainability and different things here yeah. all throughout the conversation. Yeah. Um, can you tell me, what do you mean when you say sustainability for Gabriola? Yeah, what's, what's, a, what's, what's fits into it's, your... It's a big word. <laughs> yeah, it is, right? <laughs> yeah, there are so many ways that we can be sustainable, economically, uh, socially, health-wise, food-wise, energy-wise. Um, we're kind of working in all of those areas, in one way or another. Uh, I think the main thing is t so that our footprint here on Gabriola is minimized so that we're not affecting the ecosystems any more than we have to. Um, that's hard to do, to, to do that. Um, and there's a lot of things that need to be done to make sure that we minimize it. And, and those are, that's, that's kind of what sustainable Gabriola wants to do is to reduce our impact on the land so that the natural ecosystem can thrive. Right. Even though there's 4,000 and change people living here. Um, well, yeah. What's the impact been on you and the people who are involved with Sustainable Gabriola uh, of the wildfire season this summer? The extreme wildfires yeah, you know, that yeah. we've been seeing in La Hena and in Kelowna and Shushwap and, yeah. you know, and across Canada. So just wondering, you know, you, you live and breathe this, this, this sustainability values. Um, um, what's been going through your mind this last couple of months? It's, it's, it's scary. Um, just to look at the statistics on wildfires is pretty scary. And it's not just here, obviously, it's, it's everywhere. In, in many jurisdictions, if you look at a graph of wildfire incidents over the years, it's just going up and up and up and up. Right. Um, that's, that's scary for other climate change reasons because when forests burn, they emit tons of carbon dioxide. So that's adding to the climate change problem. But it's also becoming more and more difficult for forest ecosystems to regenerate because of, of the forest here we have around us you know I look out the window there you can't see it on the screen of course but I can see dead cedars a couple there another one dying right there um, and our ecosystem is is changing it's not the same ecosystem that it, that thrived here 50 years ago um, and I'm not saying we're expecting a forest fire here, although it's quite possible. But in, in, in other places where forests have been 
burned significantly, it's very difficult for a, that forest to regenerate because the conditions now are quite different from when that forest started growing. Um, so the, an area that gets burnt will grow back but it'll be different and it may not be as healthy a forest that as it existed before a fire came. So that's, that's why the f significant increase in the incidence of forest fires is a great concern mm -hmm. to me mm -hmm. and to sustainable get real on I mean, it's been a really bad forest year in British Columbia, record-breaking by a long way. Um, but uh, as I was saying earlier, it hasn't been so bad here. Uh, oh, no forest fires on Gabriola. Knock on wood. <laughs> so far. <laughs> yes. And not that much smoke. Um, so I think Gabriolan's anxiety level about forest fires right now isn't as high as I've seen it before at during times when a, there's been a lot of smoke in the air, and B, there actually have been some small outbreaks on the island. Right. We haven't seen that this year. Right. Uh, the, the fire department works hard to make sure that we don't, and, uh, and everybody needs to join that effort. So Stephen, tell me, why do you do this volunteer work with Sustainable Gabriel? <laughs> why are you so involved in this? It's one of the wonderful things about Gabriola is that there are opportunities to get involved and there's this ethos of being involved. Um, I like to be busy. <laughs> I, um, and so I like to just do things and, and uh, it, <clears throat> it feels good to be able to contribute to the community, so I like being able to do that. Um, but, so you, but you chose Sustainable Gabriola for uh, a reason. Well, you I'm, care about I'm, the planet. I care obviously. about the planet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I also do quite a lot of uh, research and writing on climate change, and I know how serious this problem is, climate change, and how much more serious it's going to get. So we need to do everything we can to limit climate change. Okay. Yeah. Any yeah. final thoughts? <laughs> uh, Anything you want to say to the community about? Yeah, get involved is what I would say. It's, it's important to be involved in your community and to, to feel like you're making a difference. I think that's, that's why I do it, because it feels good. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Pleasure. Yeah. Okay. You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television, for you, by you. Thanks, Teresa. Next, we're going to take you to the Gabriela Museum, where local resident George Georgiev, inventor of a bicycle that once broke a world record for speed, gave an entertaining talk about his life's work. Welcome, my dear Gabriola people. You know, let's talk a little bit about what had happened in the last 40 years here with me, my family, and my riders, Sam Whittingham and Daniel West. This man here has more gold medals for Canada than any other a paraplegic person. He's not paraplegic, he's... Amputee. So he's an Olympian. And, and this man here has broke all the records that one can break on human power alone, on human power alone, just pedaling with now any assist. He, he was the first one to go over 70 miles an hour, the first one to go over 75, 
the first one to go over 80, and the final result was 83 mile an hour, which is, which is a speed venture with one of these things here on the very flat area, long about 10 miles. You start from the 10th mile and end up measured in the last 200 meters. Uh, 200 meters, he was passing of over 83, 84 mile an hour. Uh, you can see it all on the YouTube, it's all posted there. So he's my hero. <laughs> and uh, he'd been riding my cycles, and that's why we call them... <laughs> Stefan, Stefan, <laughs> my little do my daughter said, they are Samsicals. <laughs> so, they're all Samsicals. And this particular one there, nobody has raised it yet. It is a novelty with, uh, with electronics, and you don't have a window on it. As you see, there is no window, but inside you have a screen, and you have through the video, you see what's going outside. And the last year, uh, two, two, three years ago, was the first thing written but no success so far. <laughs> anyway this is the fastest cycle with with window there are other cycles that go a little bit faster which do not have windows <laughs> cycles with no windows go faster because the window takes a lot of uh, has a lot of resistance and because we use only half a horsepower to three quarter horsepower to go 80, 85 miles an hour with that amount of energy, that means the vehicle has to be super efficient, have to slip through the air without air knowing that something is passing through. <laughs> <laughs> That's very important. And I succeeded by chance. I didn't know because I'm not an engineer, I'm not aerodynamist. And I did, but I was making these little things as a child in Bulgaria and creating little airplanes and all sorts of aerodynamic uh, objects. And I used to fly them with the ropes and other things and trying to see. And when I came to Canada, first thing I went to Canada, Tara, I said, they have all the tools here so I can do something. <laughs> so that's how I started. Uh, many, many years ago, in 1972, when I arrived in this country, from a city called Varna, on the Black Sea coast. It's a resort town. Some people say it's very beautiful. And uh, um, that's, I ended up here. I ended up here because I really had, from 1930s, relatives from Bulgaria, relatives, my cousins. They One day they came and said, why don't you come to our country? So I came and I stayed. You see how that's, that's how easy it was. Concerning this uh, uh, in innovation that my daughter, uh, daughter called them inventions, they're sort of innovations. Uh, when you have a puzzled mind, we have uh, a curiosity of something. And if you orient yourself in some direction, you can succeed if you're tenacious. Tenacity is important to be persistent. And the most important thing is, to learn from your mistakes. I have made so many mistakes, <laughs> it's incredible. But this is the most important thing, not to be successful from the start, but the process, the road you're taking to actually actual success in the end. So this bike is the fastest with, with window. That bike is faster about seven to eight miles faster than this one because there is no window. There is no resistance. The window, you know, pushes you back. Yeah. So that's it's basically about aerodynamics and the bicycles. When I came in Toronto in 1972, I read uh, Popular Science and in California, somebody was doing very interesting things with these ideas. I said, I can, I can do that. I was dreaming to do that, why not? You know, in the old country over there where we were cycling ordinary bicycles and things like that, the dream was over there to do something, to improve something. 
So I started improving on the bicycles from the very, very beginning, young age. And the truth is I have never, I actually refused to ride an ordinary bike. All the bikes that I ride, I build. <laughs> you can see me on the island riding my funny things, you know. Most people know. Uh, what else I can tell you about this, uh, this uh, particular uh, mechanism? It takes, takes uh, not only engineering, but it takes a vision to do something so extraordinary that nobody have el uh, else had built. So you have sort of a dream, and you start fiddling with it, attempting, uh, trying. This is most likely the fourth or the fifth try which I succeeded. And it's obviously, you know now, that he broke the world record. Thank to my engine. <laughs> Relentless. He sits inside. He said, how do you breathe? People don't know because there is no openings. How do you breathe? But because of the disc wheels, when you start moving, they become fans. They start carrying air. And you can f feel the air behind your head passing by and going from the you have a cyclone inside. So he can last, it. he last a, uh, uh, an hour riding on this thing and break the world record. Eight, he went, night, uh, how old? 92 kilometers for one hour. From here to Victoria for one hour on a bicycle. <laughs> so that's, but it's, everything comes to the efficiency of the machine and the power and tenacity of the rider. Then, a few years ago, uh, Sam suggested we put his, uh, his dear wife inside and she broke the world record for the woman. You know, his wife, Andrea, and my wife, Andrea, had, um, you know, they had the same name. And they, he and Gabriola, they, we had a very good relationship. Unfortunately, he disappeared. He is now on Quadra, but good because he learned how to make bicycles, and now he's most likely the best bicycle builder after Marinoni, the famous Marinoni. Do, have you heard the, the man from Montreal? The whole world knows him. So now Sam Whittingham has a business producing an upright cycles, ordinary cycles, and he's world famous now with, not with this thing, but with this you know, bicycle building. And, uh, and Daniel Wesley, he's world famous simply because he broke all the records with a hand power. He goes on, he said he went 30, uh, for the third, what was, 34 mile an hour? 31. 31 mile an hour. 31 mile an hour pedaling, pedaling with, uh, with his arms. People, <laughs> People see this thing and there were cyclists there and he was going faster than the cyclist and sitting down with him pedaling on the on a hand cycle. Meanwhile, there were people from Europe there. And so how come this Daniel Wesley is faster than most of the cyclists there? So decided people from Holland and other places, they start buying my cycles. And as you know, in Holland, for example, is the center of the cycling in Europe. Everybody cycles there. They produce cycles. They do. And when they start, when these people start buying cycles from Gabriola, I said, ah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I've been living for the last 35 years, selling uh, cycles for people with disability in Holland and other places in Europe. Then the European Union put some restrictions now, so and I'm I'm too old now to brag about it. So I, I kind of make from time to time, but not always. So uh, I would like you to hear the voices of these two guys. They are better speakers than I am. Yeah, he, he, he's going. He's going. This guy's again full of you know what. Okay. This is Sam Whittingham. He's talk a little bit to you about his experience with me, how torturous I was in the beginning. He came as a little teenager to me, quite obnoxious. I said, sit down. And then he 
figured it out like nobody else. George, George, you have <laughs> Oh, what a guy. I love you, George. Um, yeah, I'm sure we all do. Anyone who knows George, you can't help it. Um, it's really special to be here. Um, I lived here briefly for two years. Um, I grew up on Quadra Island, so a very similar island to this. Um, but uh, meeting George when I was an obnoxious teenager <laughs> changed my life. It really did. Um, and I still, for better or for worse, I always think if I'm in a, if I'm in a tough, or I'm thinking about a tough problem, I go, what would, what would George do? And then I do the exact opposite. <laughs> That's not true at all. Um, there's so many, I, it's, just, it's been a privilege to just find George at that time in my life, and I was, I was riding regular bicycles, but I, there was always a creative spirit in me where I thought there was more, there was more, there was more things, there was more things to explore and play. And um, when I met George, I went, oh my God, here's a guy, here's a guy who plays. He plays with everything. He's curious about everything. He thinks about the big problems. And I think the biggest thing that I, that I have learned and still try to carry this, of course, I get lost in the weeds like everyone else, but I think when you're, when you're looking at a, a problem or, a, or you're curious about something, rather than getting a, and, and George always calls it the tinkle tinkle, the jewelry, the distractions, the little things. It's like, no, 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 no. Think about the big problem. What's the, what's the big thing and tackle that and tackle it with curiosity and be willing to just fall on your face over and over and over again and not worry about it because you're gonna get there, you're gonna get somewhere. You may not get there wherever you thought there was when you started, but you're gonna get somewhere. And um, I think I've approached that with everything I do now and it's all it's really is thanks to meeting george and being i mean we were i like to say we were a team for 25 years um we were a system if you will it's uh i mean george would build the bikes and i would the engine and would ride them um and then i would try to help design them and he would tell me i was full of yeah <laughs> and then do it the right way <laughs> But no, it was that it was that sense of play, and um, I carry that forward into building bicycles now and in all things. I just think, you know, what, what, what would George do? And uh, I love you for that. I think I think about you all the time, and um, it's a real treat to be here. I, I mean, we stopped we stopped racing. I don't even know. Was it five years ago? Eight years ago? I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, we move on with other things and other projects and stuff. And to actually come back, and it's, it's so fun to go and look at the pictures and the old articles. And there's these beautiful, I mean, Janine and Stefan have put together this great thing in the, in the Gabriella Museum. Um, it's, 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 you know, I met, I met you as a teenager, and now I'm already looking back on the old days. You know, I'm now 51. How did we meet? Well, a very a mutual friend of ours named Paul Buttermer um, was already harassing George about about bicycles and what he, and uh, and was was helping a lot in their in the early days. And at that time, and George can correct me if I'm wrong, but he was basically building the bicycles to fit him so he could try them, and then trying to find other athletes to kind of shoehorn into, shoehorn into them. And I happen to be the right size. It's really, it's really the, only, the only thing that made me qualified to ride these bikes was that I was the right size. Um, and anyway, our mutual friend Paul Buttermer uh, saw me in a bike race. I was doing regular bike racing and said, hey, do you want to come try these crazy contraptions? Do you want to strap yourself inside a pod and hurl your way down the road? Nothing could go wrong. And I said, that sounds amazing. Yes, of course. And, uh, and that's, that's quite literally how it started. And in the early days, I mean, I mean, we eventually got to the point where we were breaking records and 
we got fairly well known and all this stuff. But the but for the first ten years, we were not. I mean, we we were making mistakes all over the place. We were going to races, but nobody knew who we were. We were figuring it out, but we were playing. We were having a great time and uh, watching what worked and what didn't and where where things could be improved. And in the end, I think we started to teach everyone else, you know, possible ways of how to do things. And uh, I can see now, it's, it's funny uh, when I watch the events and I watch other teams, um, I see so much of the influence of George's designs from 30 and 40 years ago, stuff that worked and they haven't been able to improve upon. And so, so many of those things have made it into the, the innovations that you see, and I see it in all the hand cycles that are out there now. I see it in many of the bicycles, um, even the work George now does in the sort of electric bicycle field. You see that, I mean, anyone who knows George, even for two minutes, knows how infectious his personality and his enthusiasm and his innovations are. You just, you just can't help but get wrapped up in all of that. And, uh, I've been getting wrapped up in it since 1989 or something. Yeah. Um, anyway, yes? What is it like to go fast? What is it like to go fast? What experience like? Yeah, this, this is the question that has been asked many times of me. Um, I'm not an adrenaline junkie, which sounds crazy. Um, but it was the feeling of efficiency. And what it feels like... Hmm. It's really loud. That's the number one thing. It's really loud. You're strapped in what is basically a speaker cabinet resonating the sound of the road. Um, as you can see, the bikes are really small, so only a couple of inches off the ground, hurtling your way down, peering through a little windshield. I can't, and it's so tailored to me, and we call it tailored. I don't say it's, I don't say that the bike is anything other than like wearing a tailored suit. So I can't move other than my legs. I can move my hands a little. Um, and so there's a real feeling that you and the bike are one thing and you're hurtling down the road and yeah, I don't know how to explain it other than if you've ever, if you've ever been on any kind of vehicle where you've lost the brakes or you're slightly out of control, <laughs> it has that kind of, yeah, panicked feeling a bit, um, but there's a comfort in it too, knowing that it will end. Um, yeah. How do you stop? There are brakes in them, so like bicycle brakes. Uh, depending on where we are, it's uh, it, normally when we did the speed records, you would, you, you would get up to speed over five or six or seven or miles, depending on the course. You were timed over 200 meters, and the whole course had to be dead flat. So, that's, and, uh, and then there's usually a slowdown area of a kilometer or a mile or so afterwards. Um, but that's a good, the, I mean, one good point there is that the whole, that all of this was about asking one big question, and that is how fast can a human being go? It's a really simple question. We've all, you know, it's like when you're a kid, you, you run as hard as you can and see how fast you can go. Um, and so that was, it was not about the adrenaline or about, about necessarily going fast or the feeling of going fast. It was just an, trying to answer that question. like. With only, with only your brain and your legs, how fast can you go? And with no gravity, nobody's pushing you, no engine, no wind. I mean, all of these things are restricted. You can't have any of that. So it's just a, it's just a really simple question. How fast can a human being go? Um, and, and I think George and I just shared, and I'm sure Daniel too, that answering that question, like, well, with the, with the minimal tools we've got, what can you do? Um, I don't know if that answers. I think I meandered. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. Did we crash them? We sure did. Um, well, every crash is different. Uh, some are easy and no problem. Some were terrifying and horrific. Um, amazingly. I never got hurt um, in 20 years of doing this and some pretty big crashes, never really got more than a bit of a scrape and a bruise. Um, and that's a testament to, I mean, 
George, I mean, to get, when we would do these attempts, I mean, one of the things that still, still I, I always have this vision is like, whatever it was, whether we were doing a speed record attempt or a one hour endurance event, or I mean, Paul Buttermer, who used to ride with George, used to do 24 hour events and stuff like this. But the one thing you always knew at the very end is that somebody had to catch you because we're taped into these things. I can't get out on my own. So you had to finish whatever you were doing and then come in and get caught. And for 25 years, after every event, whatever I was trying to do, whether it went well, whether it went badly, whether we set a world record, basically, no matter what had happened, I knew that at the very end, what I was going to see was George doing this. <laughs> With a very big, worried smile on his face. <laughs> wondering how it went, how I was doing, and where, was I going to stop in time before I ran him over? <laughs> And sometimes I ran him over. Um, I, yeah, I meandered again, didn't I? Um, crashing, yeah. Had a couple of big crashes, but again, nothing, nothing horrific in the end. Yeah. Well, he was scared a cup out in the last one. Yeah. He, um, he took off, and he flew about 200 yards over the south Pacific. Why am I far away from them? Why am I far away? What's happening? Why is so quiet? He was flying. <laughs> sideways and then poof. well that's happened when you are 80 mile an hour because this is a wing and it wants to fly <laughs> until it crashes down to the anyway I mean w one of the good points is it actually felt very safe in this vehicle because one of the things that makes it so fast is one of the things that makes it so safe as well the, it, it, the very slippery shape and nature of it means that even when it's sideways, even when it's rolling, um, there's not a lot to get caught either on the ground or caught by the air. It just tends to keep going. And as long as there's not something to actually physically run into, and we were pretty adamant. There were some courses where we, we would feel it was unsafe and we would ask them to remove you know, posts on the side of the highway or whatever it was. Because if you hit that, obviously that's a whole different game. Um, but the truth is, if you don't hit anything, it can just kind of slide and do what it does through the air, and it's kind of slippery. I'm going to hand this over to Daniel, okay. and I, I'm, I'm very curious to hear some things from you. I haven't seen Daniel in... 10, 15 years or something like that. So this is, it's a really cool reunion for us. And I'm, yeah, Daniel. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, George. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. Nice that the weather's cooperating. Now, um, you know, I think I got to give a bit of background about myself just to let you know where I came from and how I got involved with George. And then I'll explain a little bit about the equipment that we uh, went through. Um, my, uh, I, I was out with some friends in 1973 when I was 13, and they wanted to go and jump on a moving freight train, and I had a funny feeling in my stomach that that wasn't a good idea. But I didn't listen to it. And uh, fell under the train. The same weekend that I, that happened to me, I, um, Rick Hansen, was in the back of a pickup truck and the truck went off the road and he got hit with the toolbox. And we both landed in the hospital in uh, New Westminster and Royal Columbian Hospital. And uh, even back then, we were having fun racing, racing our wheelchairs down the hallways. He's uh, two years older than me, so he would get a little bit of a lead on me. And I don't know if you re remember some of those hallways in the basements of some of these hospitals have these huge magnetic doors and he would just pop the doors like this as we were going through and these wheelchairs that we were racing back then they were dinosaurs big chrome steel folding things with footrests that i didn't need too much of and they would knock those doors right back open anyway I went my way, Rick went his, and I got involved in some disabled sports back then, and played some basketball um, with Rick and Terry, and um, 
But, uh, you know, I always wanted to do a little bit of racing, wheelchair racing. And um, the wheelchairs that we had, you know, like I said, they were just the fold-up type, and that's what we started on. And, um, and then before too long, I came up with this idea that I needed to get a custom chair built. So I thought, well, where do you go? And who's building something right now that looks like it would work for me? And I lived in Surrey at the time. And there was a place that was building sulkies. Do you guys know what a sulky is? They drag behind horses and they race these things. And I thought, well, geez, you know, they could make a, a really small one with just four wheels and it would be perfect. And it was. And so I started racing that. And before too long, I started making some uh, pretty good progress with my wheelchair racing. And then by chance, one of the other guys that I was racing with, he mentioned to me that uh, there, he lived in Nanaimo. His name's Doug White. And uh, he says he knows this guy, George, and I should come over and meet him because he's building these things called hand cycles. And, uh, you know, when you're in a wheelchair, you're in a wheelchair. Not much goes on in a wheelchair. I mean, you go slow, you know, if there's this kind of gravel right here, you're going slower. You know, if there's a bit of an incline, oh, well, that's not good either. And if it's a downhill, well, geez, that's not good either. Um, so um, George was building these really neat hand cycles and I thought, holy smokes, that thing is gonna give me wings. It's gonna set me free. So, you know, I ended up getting one of those, and, uh, and then we started racing it. And then, um, you know, then, uh, you know, I mentioned to him that, you know, I, I probably want to still race the wheelchair some, and, and maybe he could help me design one. And we built maybe two or three in total. Um, I remember the first one that he built me, uh, I had to go and race in London, England. And the year before I raced there and won, I was racing with all these guys and they were crafty guys, you know, they were like sneaky guys, really. They would stay in your draft and, and then they would pull out and pass in the last minute or two. Oh, that wasn't playing fair to me. So anyway, the next year I come by with this uh, new chair that George made me and um, and the same thing was happening. They had the world champion there named Heinz Fry. They had the best guys from England and, and the rest of uh, Switzerland and Germany. And, um, and I found myself in the front of the pack quite a bit of the time. And I, and I realized that these guys are just going to use me up again like they did last year. So I had, to, I had to come up with a plan quickly. So what I did was I turned to this one guy who was a sweetheart of a fella, um, Dave. And I says, Dave, you know what you're going to do is I'm going to let you win. I'm going to hold Heinz Fry back. I'm just going to pretend I'm tired, dog tired, and you just go. So with about two miles to remaining, he just went and kept going and going. And I kept looking like I was dog tired. And, and sure enough, at the last minute, Heinz Fry pulls out and goes around me. So I tucked into his draft. Now, when you race a wheelchair, there's not much, um, like you can't say, oh, I'm going to be the fastest or I'm going to do, you know, this or that. Um, but what you can do is you can break it down into little areas. So what I did was I told myself I'm going to be really good at climbing hills and really good at doing a right-hand turn. And that's what happens at the end of that race. At the end of that race, you can turn right and you go up the bridge, up the... Uh, I guess it's the clock tower bridge, the London bridge, finishes on the top of the bridge. And uh, so, fast into the corner, fast up the hill, and I couldn't believe it, I came in first. And that is thanks to George and his, his, his development of that wheelchair of mine. Um, you are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television, for you, by you. Well, that's all from us here at Island View. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.